always come with a certain hesitation to lecture on black women in antiquity because difficult as it has been to rescue the black as such from antiquity in the light of all that has been done to suppress and obscure that history, it has become even more difficult to rescue the black woman from antiquity. In the same way in which we have found an attempt by the white to overwhelm the black and to put a shadow over the black, we have found in many cultures and civilizations of the world an attempt to put the woman under the shadow of man's ego. This has not been so in Africa as it has been in Europe and Asia. I'm not going to present to you some idyllic story of the African respect for the woman. It is rooted not in simple idyllic legends. It is rooted in a profound creation myth. We have been taught, and perhaps it was just a symbolic story or an allegorical fable, but we have been taught that man began in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Now that story, like the beginnings of man in the Bible, is not supposed to be taken literally because man has no knowledge of how he began except on this planet. Man has no knowledge about how the universe began. Within the last few years, we have come very close to understanding how the universe began. Bell Labs, some years ago, found the noise that is behind the universe a noise that will never pass because that represents, they say, the bang, the first big bang out of which this universe came, the tremendous explosion of the universe. But the more we are, look at the universe, the more we become aware of its extraordinary complexity and its, its extraordinary size. Last week, it was discovered, in fact, that we have only observed or have only intuited one-tenth of the mass in the universe. However, in spite of the mystery and the magic that still surrounds us, one thing we are very clear about now, we do know how man came on this planet, and we do know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that first man was African. And we do know now something further, which is far more important, and that is that all creatures now living on the earth that are called Homo sapiens sapiens come from a black woman of about, about 120 to 140,000 years ago. Just a few years ago, this was not known. This is very, very recent. We have known for a long time that humankind, man and woman, was born in Africa. That does not mean a thing. Apes were born in Africa too. So that by itself meant absolutely nothing. What we have recently discovered is far, far more important. What they have discovered is that not only the first man and woman was born in Africa, but the last man, the last stage of man and woman was born in Africa. There are six stages in the development of humankind and if I use the term man, forgive me, it is not sexist, it's a habit. There are six stages in the development of man, and it was assumed that man came out of Africa at a very primitive, low-level stage, and then he evolved the highest stage in Europe and Asia. So that when I was going to university, if it were ever raised that man was born in Africa, my professor, whether he was in Europe or America, would say, fine, we all know that, we all accept that, but that doesn't mean that they're equal. All it means is that man came out at a very crude, incomplete stage, black, yes, but then he emerged into higher refined white type, which developed civilization and then brought it back to the unfortunate benighted barbarians in Africa. So that the fact that man was born in Africa was not anything of lasting significance. Then came an extraordinary study 
which was only published about a year and a half ago, Oxford, of all places, Oxford. One of the most conservative universities in the world, one of the first universities in Europe, published a study from 11 doctors, which claimed with scientific precision that there was now no doubt that the African provided the founding population of the modern world. In other words, the last man on earth, the final stage of man, the most evolved stage of man, carrying the brain case of modern man with the size and convolutions of the brain of modern man was an African. And since then, studies have come out of Hawaii, studies have come out of California, which shows that a black woman mothered all people on the planet at this time. And they have been able to trace it through blood studies, DNA, poly analysis of DNA, polymorphisms, and they could show you that the black woman carries everything. No other woman does. She carries every element. There is a certain stage at which there is a break off, and one of those elements is just, just resides in her. It doesn't reside in other people. It doesn't make them inferior, but it makes it quite clear that they are branches, mutations, extensions of that central woman. Hence, the myth we have in the Bible, and we are not attacking the Bible because you have to understand it was necessary for the early patriarchs who wrote the Bible. And the Bible is full of truth, historical truth. Do not dismiss it. But it was necessary for the early patriarchs who had no idea of what had happened, who had no idea about beginnings, and who assumed that their theories and assumptions came to them from God above. It was only natural for them to assume, since they were in charge and they were male, that God created the male first, and then he took a rib out of the complex male and made woman. Woman, in fact, is physiologically more complex than the male. Hence, Women cannot come out of men. Eve cannot come out of Adam. Only Adam can come out of Eve. The Africans did not have that absurd theory of events. The Africans had created the myth of Isis and Osiris. Isis and Osiris, unlike Adam and Eve, gives you a vision of the completeness of the human through the equality of the male and the female. God is not a man. God is not a woman. God comprises both. And the strange story of Isis, the great black god is searching for Osiris, the great black god, is that you find that Set, which became the prototype for Setan, that's African, by the way. All of these concepts are created, strangely enough. We find it after so many hundreds of years in Africa. Satan is Egyptian. Satan is a force, the dark force, the evil force. Let me not use words like dark, the evil force. Satan destroys Osiris, and he's split into many pieces and Isis goes searching for Osiris, and she finds most of the pieces, but there is one piece missing. We need not name that piece. It is the piece that is absent in woman and present in man. But that piece cannot make sense without the woman. In other words, that piece is what completes them. So that it is not as if you have the great male god and the inferior female god, she becomes the sister, the wife, the mother. She is all that is female in the, the female principle of the universe, and he is all that is the male principle of the universe, which completes the universe in order to create life. So that you have a vision of creation complete through the woman that you do not find in the early absurd 
imaginative version that you find in the Adam and Eve myth. That Adam and Eve myth, interpreted as it was, as it was later on in history, led to profound conceptions of the woman as inferior, and sometimes in some civilizations as essentially evil. So she's she supposed to be the great seductress, the weaker kind, etc. This was not the case in the African mythology. So that you already had a divine myth which gave a basis. It was a sort of bedrock for a reality that could give the woman greater freedom and power. It is not an accident, therefore, that many of the goddesses of the Europeans were black. They could have chosen their own women, they chose some of their own women, but the most important goddesses were black. Not just for the African now, in the civilization of the Greek. The Greek was so profoundly affected by the Africans that the goddess of chastity was a black woman, Artemis. The goddess of wisdom was a black woman, Minerva. The goddess of beauty was a black woman, Diana. And many of their great mythological figures which were critical to the vision of history, the history of the Greeks in the Odyssey, the woman who draws, who has the power to draw Odysseus and all his crew into her, is Circe, who is represented as a black woman with African features on the Greek vases. The woman who helps Jason win the Golden Fleece is a black woman, Medea. The woman who marries Perseus, the Greek hero, is a black woman, Andromeda. If you see them represented in Hollywood, they're all white. But if you go back to the original vases, the original art of the Greeks, you will find that the only women they could find to represent the finest attributes in the feminine world were black women. Actual black women. They were literally living black women in Ethiopia who were made into legendary goddesses in Greece. That first invasion of Africa by Europe was not an invasion like the invasions that occurred later. The European was startled by the advances of the African. So startled that Alexander decided to build his capital in Africa rather than go back into Europe. And every major Greek, every major Greek thinker Thales of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudocius, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, they all came down. Plato, all of them came into Egypt. And those who did not come claimed they came because it was so prestigious. And they, therefore, saw women differently. In this new edition of black women in antiquity, there is a remarkable woman called Hypatia. For a long time, we thought she was a Greek woman, until Beatrice Lumpkin, doing studies in the rights of women in ancient Greece, found that black women had power and freedoms that the white woman was not allowed. The Greek woman could not head a department in a, in a university, but she could in Egypt. She could not pursue a scientific pursuit without a companion or someone in charge of her, it was possible in Egypt. So that when they found, when she studied Hypatia and the freedoms Hypatia had and the kind of work she was doing, it was easy to come to the conclusion no Greek woman at the time was allowed those opportunities. And in that Alexandrian war where you have a mix later of the Greek and the African, you find the African woman is has certain advantages that the Greek woman does not have and was not to have for a long time to come. Now, Isis, the great goddess, affected, as I say, Europe as deeply as she affected Africa. All major European powers built shrines to the black goddess Isis. Even the Roman Lunatic, Caligula, built a shrine to Isis. 
out in the British Isles we find shrines to ISIS. That was the beginning of the Black Madonna. You go to Norea in Spain, not just black with Africoid features. Some of them later on became black skinned but with European features because as some of them became destroyed or lost or broken, they would retain, they would build them again and retain the blackness of ancient times, but they would give them European type features. Sometimes the child would be African, but the woman would have a European face but the black skin. And then later when this was found, and of course the movement against the African or the reduction of the African became uh, something that became significant in the life of Europe, then they would try to explain it away. The reason why it looks black is because it's been gathering dust over the ages suit. The reason why it looks black, it fell into fire. The reason why it looks black, they use the wrong clay. Anything to explain it away. But when you go to the roots of the religion, when Jesus died, he was not considered important except by his followers. The Europeans did not have any respect for Jesus the Christ. There was no Christianity in Europe. The only people who had Christianity were the Africans. The word Christ is an African word, K-R-S-T. When the Greeks later on took that up and the Romans they call Christus, it is first appears in African Christ. The concept of the Christ, the eight form, the seven stages are forms of man which then became, becomes the supreme divine form, the Christ. Hence you have Christianity before Christ. The idea, the concepts, even the words, even the images, the virgin birth, the three kings, those are Egyptian ideas. Those were the three great stars in the firmament, the three kings, which then became the three powers on earth that came to worship the divine form. It's all there. It's on the temples of Luxor before the birth of Jesus. And then when Jesus came, making myth real, as only gods can do. When Jesus came and he died, the sword that was pushed into him was a European sword. The Romans cut him to pieces because the Jewish high priest wanted it. Because Jesus challenged as all rebels do, as all men of truth do, challenged the order of the day. And he had to be sacrificed for that. It was Isis and her little child Horus suckling at her breast that was worshipped throughout the world as Mary and her child Jesus. And when we first see Jesus on a coin in the second century AD, there is a Roman face, European, and on the other side is a man with dark skin, woolly hair and a Semitic nose, an Afro-Semitic type, who is represented for the first time physically, Jesus the Christ. And all this has been pushed aside, but it's there, it's there. As you go back, you find these figures, you find the profound impact of the black woman on the world. And some extraordinary women appeared in the world. Makeda, the queen of Sheba. This is no myth. We have found stories about her in the Kebra Negast. It's been translated now. And we could see what actually happened. As it was represented in some of the Jewish chronicles, it appears as though this woman was just a beautiful black woman and she came to Solomon's court and Solomon got very obsessed with her and built this fantastic palace and, and then gave her a son and she went back to Ethiopia. It was not as simple as that. It was not confined to romantic concerns. The reason why Solomon was paying such tremendous respect to the Queen of Sheba is because the Queen of Sheba had a larger empire than Solomon. One of her merchants, Tamarin, alone, had more than 300 camels and more than 500 ships. One merchant. She controlled a part of Ethiopia, a part of Egypt, 
a part of Persia, vast domains. And she was involved in a very important trade. A very important trade links had been established by her. She therefore went to Solomon as an equal. Solomon built a palace, or at least a room within his palace, where the walls were made of fine crystal from the floor to the ceiling, and treated her with enormous respect because it wasn't just romantic, it involved trade links and connections. trade links and connections. When she came back to Ethiopia, she bore a son for Solomon, Menelik I. That is the longest line in the world. There, are, there is no line, by the way, there is no line in the history of monarchies in the world that is as long as the Ethiopian. It dates from the romance between the Queen of Sheba and Solomon and goes all the way down to Hale Selassie with just a break of about 300 years. We find, however, that the Ethiopians who had moved up into Egypt, even though the woman was more important or certain aspects of the woman was more important than the man, when the movement when that movement went up into Egypt, you find the male priests trying to seize power from the woman. So they built a concept of the sovereign, the pharaoh, as something that could only be a male because there were certain things that they associated symbolically with the pharaoh. So even though women became powers behind the throne, it is only when they came to the end of a dynasty they allowed a woman to reign. And then came extraordinary women who reigned anyway. Hatshepsut was one such woman. She refused to accept that the heir, the male heir should reign. She said, no, no, no. And they said, but you are not male. You cannot be the true pharaoh. And she says, yes, I'm male. And she stuck a beard on her chin. And she said, I dare you. Do not call me she. Call me he. I'm in charge. And she, she said, I came as Horus, darting fire among my enemies. And everybody was afraid of her. For half a century, no one on earth, male or female, wielded such incredible power. And the thing about her, and it's very important to note because it seems to run through the history of great women, is that they were not just power hungry. She had to assert her power and she had to blend and merge both, both male and female what had become to be accepted as male and female attributes in order to assume the full pharaonic powers. But she was not so much concerned as males usually are, being first the hunters and gatherers, whereas the women protected and built the household, that the strange thing we notice with women, it is very rare that they get involved in expansionist wars. Whenever a woman is fighting, she's fighting a, a battle of revolution against an invader. We find that again and again. There is only one exception I have found, and that is Queen Judith, a Falasha Jew, a black queen who was very angry with the Christians. Something had been done to her in her challenge. We always have exceptional cases because of personal quirks. She wanted to kill all the Christians, and she ravaged their lands. That is one exception. In the other cases I know of, in particular in the case of Hatshepsut, and one or two other queens I shall mention, they engaged in necessary war, never in expansionist war. They, they, built, they built the most remarkable temples. When you go and see Hatshepsut's temple, it is unbelievable. The only other man, the only other pharaoh who built incredible statues and temples like her, I think, was Ramesses the Great. Her temples were extraordinary. And she didn't just build, 
she traded. We find her with great ships, some of the most remarkable ships of ancient times going right up into Somalia, bringing back things out of the heartland of Africa back into the Egyptian world. And you find that there are other queens who did not assert themselves with such aggressive authority, but yet had fantastic power. Queen Tai or Queen T is one such woman. That is the one I admire most, because in spite of her incredible power, which also lasted for half a century, she crystallizes within her the fantastic power of a great queen. She crystallizes within her not only that authority, but also the finest things we associate with women. When she was 13 years old, still a child, she married the pharaoh who was 53. She bore him several sons. Almost all her sons are immortal. Agnaton was her son from this marriage. Tutankhamun was her son from this marriage. Smenkare was her son from this marriage. She bore him four sons. Three of them are of tremendous importance. And he loved her, her pharaoh loved her to distraction, so great that he refused to listen to the priests who insisted that when he carved her out, she should be knee-high, that he should show his incredible godlike authority over her, the woman. He said, no, no, sir. This is my woman I deeply love. She is my equal. And he insisted that all the great statues built, she should sit beside him as an equal. She, he cut a lake one mile long. We can still see it, Lake Tai or Lake T, an ornamental lake one mile long. He built temples to her. He wrote poems that immortalized her beauty and his love. And she, as he grew old and began to wither with age, she became, as it were, the true pharaoh. When the kings of Asia wanted to talk with Egypt, they went to her, not to him. And then came Akhenaten, her great son. Akhenaten was the man we associate with the religious reformation. Akhenaten insisted that there was only one God, which the Africans had accepted before, but he went further. He was to affect Moses. He went further. He says, not only is there one God, I don't want to see any other form but one form of the God. So I don't want to hear any more about your, your idols and your statues and your semi-deities. I just want one form of the God, Aton. He insisted on that, caused tremendous upheaval in Egypt insisting that there should be one form of the God. And in fact, he changed his name from Amon, which was the great African deity, to Aton, hence Agnaton. Even Tut, his son, had to be called Tutank, Tutankaton. It was later changed to Tutankamon because he lost out in the end, in spite of his great power. But the one thing while he was going through this religious reformation which split the country and weakened it, he weakened the defenses of that country. And it was Queen T who made sure that those defenses were kept strong. And then with the passing or the failure of the Akhenaten revolution, Tut began to reign. Tut was a, a little boy. He was murdered by the prime minister. And once again, in the vacuum created by his immaturity, Queen Tai became the power. So that in all that time, all the upheavals and under times of weakness and challenge, Tai became the force. And she was not just a force in terms of her great authority over Egypt. She was a woman of great beauty. It says here in this poem by her husband, the princess the most praised, the lady of grace, sweet in her love, who fills my palace with her beauty, the regent of the north and south, the great wife of the king who loves her, 
the lady of both lands, T. She was a Nubian, and she reinstated the African principle that the princesses should have precedent over the princess. And her beauty was such, and her authority was such, and her nobility was such, that everything she did, everything she wore, everything she was, was imitated by other women. Her eyeshadow, her earrings, her jewels, her necklaces, everything, her wigs, all of these were imitated by the women of the court and the common women. And as I say, once again, as in the case of Hatshepsut, rather than waging war, she built things. She filled the vacuum left by the immaturity of Tut, the age of, the age of Amenhotep III, whom she had married at an early age, and the religious obsession of Akhenaten. She gave strength where these men because of various reasons, were weak. Now, beauty, apart from the question of power, and before I leave the question of power, let me mention one thing. In Ethiopia, the African principle was retained intact. As it moved up into Egypt, there were slight modifications. One thing was kept up is that power could only be passed on through a woman. That was kept up right through the Egyptian thing, which is very unlike European. Many of the people who were claiming that Egyptians were European note this. That was not so in Europe. That was something that ran through Africa. Power can only come through a woman. And therefore, even in spite of all the fights to balance themselves up with the power of woman, it was always understood right through that the heir is determined by the mother, property, succession, power is determined by the mother. But the Candaces now in Ethiopia, when the great Ethiopian empire collapsed, when the many invaders came in, and when Ethiopia once again became a power, you notice that the brothers, whenever the males seized power, they would hold on to political power, but spiritual power would be in the hands of the women. Now, do not dismiss that because the church was not a mere appendage of the state as it has become today in most places. The church was equally powerful with the state and in some cases more powerful. And the Candaces were women who became powers in their own right. They were extraordinarily powerful women. They formed almost a sort of matriarchal clan. And even when they were not, as I say, when their brothers were in heads of state, they were heads of the spiritual capitals, running equally high priestesses of Amun with the kings of Ethiopia. Now, beauty was something, images of beauty at that time were black. For a long time, in fact, the black woman was considered to be the most beautiful woman, not just in Africa, but in Europe. Let me deal with that. Many things were discovered by black women in the, in the ornamentation of the face and the body. For example, it, were black, it was black women who first, be, who first discovered lipstick, though lipstick at that time was confined to concubines. It was the first people to use eyeshadow and timony, which ran right through the world. They were the first people to develop a vast range of perfumes and oils and pomades for the hair and the skin, etc. They were very much involved in dressing themselves up. <clears throat> and one of the things that happened partly by accident, which they made a great use of, was they discovered in puncturing the skin for beautification markings they came upon the vaccine long before Europe. The vaccine, in fact, was used in epidemics because the Africans discovered that you could take a germ, certain germs, bacterial germs, and put a small quantity into the body, and the body would develop an immunity over a period of time so that when it came in larger force, 
the body would already have an immunity against it. They therefore discovered the vaccine partly through beautification markings and also identification markings. In Europe, the black woman was considered to be so beautiful that only rich and powerful whites could have black women. As a consequence, all the French kings had black mistresses. Regardless of who they married, they had to have a black mistress. This is also true of the most powerful families in Italy and in Portugal. In Italy, the Medicis, all of them had black women. The Gonzagas had black women. The Medicis, in fact, one of them, Cardinal de Medici, one of the most powerful and richest men in Italy, he had a black mistress. He bore a son, and when he became the Pope, Pope Clement VIII, he took his black son and made him Duke of Florence. The same thing happened with the Portuguese kings. Three of the Portuguese kings have very strong African features as a result of that intermixing, because some of the black children who were born out of wedlock were taken quietly into the court. We had the most astonishing case in France. All the French kings had black mistresses, particularly the Louis. And Louis XIV had a black mistress which annoyed tremendously his queen. Because it was all very well for him to have a black mistress, but he totally neglected his queen. His queen decided to get back at him and had an affair with a black man. This was Queen Marie Therese. And a black child was born in the French court. And the king was astonished and he turned and distressed his doctors and he said, how could I give birth to a black child? And the doctors looked at him quite calmly and said, your majesty, it is quite possible that while your wife was pregnant, that black man in the court, Nabo, looked at her and the child turned black. <laughs> and the king said, it must have been a very penetrating look. <laughs> Nabo disappeared, we don't know what happened to him. But such a scandal occurred that they had to take the black daughter of the king and queen of France and put her in a monastery. She became quite famous, she became known as the black nun of Mori, and the Duke of Chartres fell in love with her. He writes an ode to her in which he speaks of the texture of her hair and the nature of her cheeks, etc., is different from that of other women that he knew. And Gauguin also had a black mistress, and Napoleon also played with the idea because Napoleon said, in order to solve this race question, a man should have three wives, a black one, a white one, and one in the middle. So he decided, since he couldn't have three wives, he picked one who was both black and white. He went to the West. He took a woman from the West Indies, Josephine, and made her his queen. Now, these are all oddities and strangenesses in the, in the European. And the curious thing about it is the contradiction that they saw the, wom the black woman as a sex symbol in the way the white woman was eventually converted into the sex symbol here in the Americas. The black woman was considered to be the beautiful woman. And the strange thing about that, she was also considered to be the saint. She was also considered to be the goddess of chastity. So a very strange contradiction began to appear in the European mind. Now, the curious thing is that out of the history that we have been looking at, all sorts of fictions emerge. For example, one of the things that has bothered us for a long time is African polygamy. If it is true that the woman is equal, how come can a man have several wives? Now, polygamy is one of the most gravely misunderstood things. Not every African could be polygamous. You had to be very wealthy and very prosperous to be polygamous. In the case of kings, polygamy was permitted both in European, Asian, American, and African worlds because it was necessary for a king to have several wives. Regardless of who was the, he picked as his queen, he had to have several wives or his kingdom would break up. The reason for that was that if there were 12 tribes or 12 peoples in a kingdom, you could not pick one from one tribe because you would insult the others. 
so that you have to have in your harem a woman from each representing each. But it, one of the things that people misunderstood, they thought that polygamy arose out of some kind of lust. Polygamous institution at its best was not a man having many wives to satisfy his lust. The problem was that they had to have some sort of social institution to protect unmarried women. Not everyone in the harem, therefore, was married by the man. A man's mother could be in his harem. A man's sister could be in his harem. Those are not his women in his sexual sense, but they are part of the household that he must maintain. And to marry a woman was no simple matter. One didn't just flick one's fingers and marry. One had to maintain that woman and her children. The Africans were very serious about that. I spent a year in Africa studying law, Swahili law. I wrote the Swahili dictionary, the first Swahili dictionary of law. And I had to go about the courts in Africa. And when I was coming out of Europe, my teachers told me, you see, the African doesn't really respect women. Because in Muslim law, all you have to say is, nimi kuacha, nimi kuacha, nimi kuacha. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and it's all over. When I got into Africa, I found it was not true. The only woman you could tell that to is a virgin. If you married a woman behind the veil, and you lifted the veil off that night, and you were quite unpleasantly surprised by what you saw, you could say to her, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and walk away. But once you entered her, you were in serious trouble. The law would follow that through and see whether she became pregnant. If she did, you would have to support that child. There was no nonsense about that. That was hard law. Wherever I went, it was hard law. And in fact, the one case there was one case that came before me. That is the first time in my life I dropped English for half an hour. It has never happened again. I learned several languages, but I never dropped English in my head. I would make quick computerized translations. But once I was sitting in the court, and I was being treated as a magistrate because although I had tried to convince the people I was working with in Africa that I was not a magistrate, that I was not inspecting the books, in England, I got the word kuchagua mixed up with another word. And kuchagua is not to inspect as an inspector, but it also means that you are examining and checking these people out. So they, every time I said, um, I have come here, kuchagua, to inspect the books, the magistrate would start to tremble because he think I was sent from the central government Nyerere's government to check him out. So sometimes I would find all court business would stop because this curious, strange inspector had arrived. Now when I started to really inspect those cases, I began to discover 99% of the divorce cases were brought by women. And women had a right to demand things out of men if they were not supporting their children and to demand things out of them if they, were, they disappeared. They could even take their property away if they suddenly decided to disappear in order to relinquish their responsibility. And in that polygamous institution, it wasn't the case of a man standing like a great lord. That was the extremely prosperous man who had to give land to each woman he married, to build great farms, to have some enormous agricultural enterprise, perhaps, then you have situations like that. The ordinary man could not do any such thing. It's therefore important to understand it in a certain perspective. The independence of woman, in fact, on the polygamy made her acquire powers greater than in Europe. So that whereas the woman in Europe emerged as a kind of surf to the man, and it is only quite recently because of strange economic, new economic changes, sudden economic changes in Western economy, women have become as powerful as men. So powerful and so sudden is that power in the European world that lots of men retreat into homosexuality. They're not accustomed to finding equal, equality in women. 
But in the African world, you do not find the same thing happening. Because when the woman entered market economy, you found many West African women having independence. Even before the slave trade, those West African women acquired an independence, an economic independence, which gave them a certain power and equality. And if the men were mad enough not to respect them in a certain way, they had various ways to deal with that lack of respect. Now we come to what happened to that woman as she came over in the slave trade. What happened to the, ma the, the black male was extremely unfortunate in, in relation to the black female because even though the black female suffered tremendously as did the man, the white man could sleep with the black female and push the black male out or he could send the black male running wild all over the plantations, thereby forcing him to enter into plural liaisons. So he can assume to some extent that he was following a polygamous bent. It wasn't polygamy, because polygamy in Africa sprang out of prosperity and stability. The polygamous relationships here sprang out of the opposite, economic, insecurity and instability. The plural liaisons with women, therefore, sprang out of an incapacity to stand one's ground, to have firm, stable relationships with women. And then what made things even worse is that women, because of the fact that they were constantly being deserted through the slave system, their men would be sent away suddenly, etc. Their, their power would be broken by the white men. They would develop less respect or they would be forced into a situation in which they would have to hold their own. They would have to protect the family, be by themselves. So a division and alienation developed that had nothing to do with the African situation. And so powerful in relation to the male became the woman that in the South, when they did a census, they found 90% of the property in the South were owned by black women. 90% of the property owned by the whites were owned by white men. In other words, only 10% of white women owned property, largely through death, whereas 90% of black women owned the property owned by blacks. So that you get a shifting occurring. And you have to understand, therefore, what was continued and what was discontinued as a result of the shock, the various things that happened as a result of the shock of the slave trade. We have to understand that a great crisis has arisen in the black family. It is not an easy thing. We have been fed with images of white beauty, for example, for a long time. Many of our men have come to disrespect their women have come to look at them with a different eye, a different consciousness. And many of our women also have come to disrespect their men, not knowing the terrifying situation out of which those men have taken a certain form. You have many films now which try to show the black in the most appalling perspective. The color purple is one of them. You read that book and you will find Alice Walker made a great point out of showing the enormous, first of all, the psychological and social situation out of which the cruelty of that man began, and then his guilt and pain and his attempt to redeem himself. When you see it in the film, you don't see that background. And when the time comes for him to send money to bring the sister back from Africa, that is put into sort of vague thread so that all that is good or strong in that man or all that is redemptive is put in the background and only his darkness, his cruelty, his evil is put in the foreground. We have to resist such films because it does not help to emphasize the fantastic alienation that has divided us as a people, not only from brother from brother, but brother from sister. We have suffered that all over the world. And only in trying to go back into the past, trying to understand the 
the kinds of ideals which our ancestors built for us, that built this beautiful balance between the man and woman, the complementarity, so that you could find certain strengths in one and weaknesses in the other, weaknesses in one and strengths in the other, that makes it possible, as in the case of Isis and Osiris, that, that what, the piece that was missing in Osiris was that which is missing in woman. And yet, Osiris could not be found and made whole, ago, whole again, save through his woman. And that is a, a symbol, an allegory, in fact, that gives us an idea of how the wholeness of humanity and the wholeness particularly of the black race cannot be found again save through that peculiar complementarity and fusion of the black man and the black woman. Thank you very much. Dr. Ivan Vance.